welcome all of us to the third and last day of July's uh, monthly seminar of Marriage God's Way. Um, let's just take a minute and say thank you for what God has taught us so far, for what He will teach us today, and also ask Him to work in us to will and to do for His good pleasure. That way, we just don't become hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Because hearing is one thing, but doing is what makes all the difference. You see, wisdom is knowledge that has been put in action. So let's pray for that wisdom in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you just to bless your name today, to worship and adore you, to say thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your love that has brought us here, that gave us Jesus and Jesus that came so that marriage can be restored to you relationships can be restored to you we can be restored to you and lord god thank you for this time that you have given us to learn from you i pray that everything you have taught us so far you will help us work in us by your spirit to will and to do for your good pleasure so right now lord i pray that you open our hearts to receive from you our ears to hear from you our minds to understand and our will to do for it is in jesus precious name we pray believe and receive the thanksgiving Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Rev Chogo, for joining us again. We bless God so much for you. Thank you, everybody who has made it with us. And if you um, see there's somebody that needs to be here, but they're not, kind of nudge them a little bit, tell them, hey, we are on. Um, and then we're going to be blessed together. So without any further ado, I'm going to give it to our speaker again of this month, um, Rev Chogo. Welcome. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I, I hope I'm clear, loud and clear. I hope uh, there's no uh, background noise. Uh, there's some activity at certain certain corner of my house. I hope that doesn't uh, interrupt um, uh, what we are doing uh, on this stream episode. Did we call it episode or stream or broadcast? I think it's a broadcast. Okay. And so thank you again for setting up this. Thank you for the opportunity afforded. Uh, I don't take it for granted uh, that there are people willing to listen to one or two things that um, I may say. I, I, I appreciate that because I recognize that uh, there are people who probably are, are, are better a mastery of what we are talking about than I am. And so um, um, it's a privilege just to have the chance to share the limited uh, experience, limited wisdom that uh, God has allowed me to have in this space. And so I hope you will appreciate and learn one or two things. Amen. All right. We need to jump into this thing uh, and conclude. I hope I'll be able to uh, conclude because there's a lot uh, to deal with. Um, and so I'll just make mention of what we discussed the past two days without necessarily getting into details. Uh, we said that uh, um, uh, intimacy in marriage is God's ultimate intention uh, for marriage. Uh, and we see that in Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife uh, and, and and the two shall become one flesh it says in verse 25 and they are both naked and they are not ashamed uh, we said uh, uh, intimacy in marriage that becoming one the two becoming one flesh to the point that there is nothing hidden uh, between the two of them so that they are naked and not ashamed because you know they are become so much of an item um, I think we, we, we must recognize that uh, that state of oneness is not just about uh, physical oneness, like we mentioned. There are many other aspects of that oneness. Uh, we said it's like a multi-faceted diamond, which has got different facets. Uh, it's got you know the intellectual facet. There has to be a way you are. Uh, appreciating each other's intellectual wavelength 
and you're you know you're tapping into it uh you do not have to operate at the same wavelength but you appreciate each other's wavelength um we say that that, that place of you can exchange ideas you can think you can process it will be a good uh, muscle especially for those of you that are, are planning to get married you begin to practice that thing of thinking together, processing ideas together. It will give you good muscle for decision making when that time comes. Uh, and decision making is big in marriage. I'm telling you, that's one of the things that really sabotages uh, oneness in marriage when you when you when you don't agree on decisions, when you don't agree on decisions that have been made. A lot of conflict arises from there. And so uh, muscling up in that area is very critical. We talked about social intimacy, that we need to be best of friends, uh, that we need to be interested in each other's social space, hobbies, interests. Uh, we need to um, make sure that we have more a, a bigger pool of common friends than those who are not our friends. And so there's got to be intentionality, there's got to be interest, there's going to be initiative, and then there's, uh, um, there's going to be intensity as we develop friendship, uh, uh, hanging out together, um, uh, being in each other's space, serving together, uh, and all that. Having fun together. Having fun together. Uh, I tell you what, uh, when I look back, we are doing 24 years now, uh, when I look back, I think uh, the, the moments when we had a bit of fun together are really the moments that really keep you going and encourage you. And so you need to create as many of them as possible um, and have this rich library of moments you had fun. And fun does not have to be expensive. Fun just has to be creative. And so may God give us grace for that. Yesterday we said there's we added one more intimacy and we said you need to have the emotional intimacy and when you talk about emotional intimacy it's you need to be communicating at a particular level um, and, and there has to be a communication chemistry that is happening and that communication chemistry we said it has to go beyond just courtesy details ideas to the place where you feel each other feelings and then the place where you're comfortable to share your deepest longings and fears and hopes and we said hey, you have to really be interested in your spouse's hierarchy of needs and figure out uh, whenever they change figure out and it you it, it, it's important to inquire what does this really mean for you and then on top of that Connected to the hierarchy of need, we said you need to know their love language and you need to love them from their love language, from the side of their love language, not from your side of love language. And that's a mistake that many people make. You love your spouse from your side, uh, which um, um, does not work. And so the sacrifice that you may need to make is to, to figure out what does love really look like for them and then make the sacrifice to love them in the way that they feel love should look like. I, and I hope it's not some weird thing they want you to do, no. But I, I hope it's just, uh, uh, you know, the, and we talked about the five languages of li love by uh, Gary Chapman. You need to buy that book. You need to buy that book. If you are truly interested in emotional intimacy with your spouse, your spouse to be, by the book Gary Chapman, um, Five Languages of Love. Very critical. Today, I want us to jump into two more facets of intimacy. Two more, and they are interesting ones. And I'll jump into what I consider to be probably. Um, one of the most important of these facets of intimacy, and that is spiritual oneness. Spiritual oneness. I need to emphasize something on the languages of love. I know the theory has been, I have 
my language of love, my spouse has their language of love, and we are focusing on each other's language of love to take care of each other. And my and, and my assertion was that, yeah, it's okay, but we need to employ all those languages of love when we are dealing with our spouse and then put more weight on their specific language of love. But you do not neglect the other languages of love that are not big for them. Deploy them, uh, but, for, but put a little bit of emphasis on the one that you uh, feel is their main language of love. Spiritual oneness. This is, you have to find a certain spiritual frequency that you're operating on as a couple. Ah, you have to. You know, um, uh, talking to, there's a time we're having a conversation with a certain, uh, some, some young people that are hoping to start dating. And they're saying, you know, Pastor, what's the metrics we should use for determining who we should date? And quickly, I remember that someone we had done uh, in one of the churches I've pastored in. And in that sermon, we were talking about Samson. The reason why Samson ended up in... Uh, he was amazingly gifted, but he got into he got it wrong when it came to choosing a spouse. He, he just got it wrong. Um, and the reason why he got it wrong, especially when he ended up with... Uh, um, uh, is it Delilah or something like that? I think it's Delilah. He, he got it wrong at three levels. Number one, he, he should have figured out, he should have looked for somebody whom they submit to the same master. Okay? Uh, a person who submits to the same master that Samson submits to. Samson was submitting to God, Jehovah, but Delilah was submitting to some other masters. Uh, money. Money was our master. Money. Show her money and she'll do anything. She'll betray even her husband. And that is, uh, you know, there the are two different masters. Then, uh -huh, mission. So you need to look for somebody who looks like their, their mission in life is headed in the same direction of your mission in life, even if it's not the same. That you can walk with each other. Delilah, I don't even know what was her main mission in life. I think she was just a slave queen. And Samson, was, his, whose mission in life was to deliver the children of Israel from the bondage of the Philistines. Uh -huh. so they got mixed up. And so at some point, missions cross purpose. And guess what? Whenever somebody's in a pit and you are outside the pit and you're trying to pull each other, you need to understand that the person that is inside the pit has more advantage. They can pull you in easier if their mission is, you know, uh, at, a, at a lower level. So I said mission need to be very clear about where are they headed in life in terms of what's their life purpose? Have they discovered it? If not, you know, what do they think it is? Okay, then thirdly, is the question of met, uh, like friendship. Um, is there some measure of friendship? And we said, and I think I mentioned it in the in the second episode I ever did uh, with this group, that uh, we are encouraging, we are beginning to encourage young people to look for spouses from their friend zone, from their friend zone. Not just some guy who's showed up, you know, in church and looks nice, and you have some nice brothers who may not be as, you know, um, gisty, but they are good brothers. They know the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they are faithful. Yes, they have a few challenges with brushing their teeth and all that, but they are potential. And, and then just picking some stranger who has wowed you, razzmatazz, uh, looks like he has just dropped from the sky. And so... Why am I saying these three? Uh, my focus there is mainly the number one, master. Spiritual oneness is when you are both fully submitted to the same master. Spiritually. Spiritually. I must, allow me, I, I'll dare say this. I'll dare say this. Um, 
if two Christians marry and their and their spiritual life and their commitment to their spiritual life is is not as um what what's the name is is not as coordinated is not they're not flowing together in their spiritual life um they're not as given as driven towards their spiritual life as submitted to their spiritual work uh one of them is dragging their feet behind then then the, and, and the other one is really trying to push if that happens and you put two muslims who are totally dedicated to their faith the two muslims who are totally dedicated to their faith will make a better couple than these two christians because it's a whole question of spiritual dynamics how are you connecting spiritually and this can even start while you're dating um there has to be a certain level of spiritual uh, 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 connection, spiritual chemistry that is taking place. Spiritually discordant uh, couples can really struggle. The Bible says God is spirit. This means that our deepest level, because God has created us in his own image and likeness. If God is spirit, if his essence is spirit, then when he created us in his own image and likeness then the part of us that is really the masterpiece that is really the essence of who we are is our spirits and this means that that is the deepest level of a, of the existence of a, of a human being who is made in the image and the likeness of god who is also a spirit we are spiritual beings we may not be spirits, but we are spiritual beings. The greatest level of intimacy you can have with another person is thus spiritual intimacy. I dare say here, good people, there are some, especially wives, that are more spiritually intimate with their pastors than their husbands, which is very sad indeed. Sad, sad, sad. And, 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 and spiritual intimacy is, is critical, good people. It is spiritual intimacy that will really that will keep you that will really keep you together when the going gets tough. If you have not invested um, in, in a certain measure to a certain extent in spiritual intimacy, uh, when the going gets tough, um, that that's why it becomes so easy for to pull apart but if you have been heavily invested in spiritual intimacy when the rubber meets the road and the going gets tough that is the one thing that sometimes will just hold you, you know, like that that thread that holds several reasons why spiritual intimacy plays a huge role in a marriage spiritual intimacy gives a couple one common authority as i've said same master you have a common authority. Having a common authority builds trust, which is a key component of intimacy. This is what allows you to be, as the Bible says, naked and not ashamed. It's much easier to be totally vulnerable with your spouse when you know that they are fully submitted to God. It's like having a court of appeal that you can go to when things are tough between you because you know that they too submit the same authority. The result is a greater sense of trust and security when you trust your spouse you will do anything for them so there's a bit of trust when you know your your husband has certain convictions same values same and that's the second thing the sec second thing that uh, the second reason why spiritual intimacy uh, uh, plays a huge role in marriage it because it gives you a common blueprint a common blueprint. Developing spiritual intimacy allows us to build uh, from the same set of plans. And this is because if we are growing in our spiritual connection, we begin to develop the same values and convictions. Mm. For example, when your spouse asks you to do something risky that is out of your comfort zone, you can pray about it and more than often than not, God will give you a sense of peace that confirms is leading you in that direction. So, so if if you have a, a a similar set of convictions and values, then 
even when you're asking each other things, making demands on each other, there's a reference point, there are boundaries. Because you subscribe to a certain blueprint. But if you don't have a blueprint, you don't have similar values, then you're surprised. Hey, my husband has been doing this. My wife has been doing this. And that's why some of these things need to be discussed as early as possible when you're starting off your journey of dating. What's your blueprint? What are your convictions? Well, but what scripture is guiding your life in this season? What are your 10, you know, uh, set of 10 values and convictions that you have come up with from your walk with the Lord? Now, spiritual intimacy also gives a couple common strength. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Some of you need to watch the movie, Not Easily Broken. In marriage, three strands may, means, it simply means yourself, your spouse, and God. In a, it's, it's a marriage of three. I, allow me to say that. Now, we, we, we've, we've, uh, we've known, and I've seen couples uh, who break up when they're first too big for them. In, in, in one, it may be a case of a disabled child or, uh, you know, mental struggles, you know, mental health issues or all sorts of things and 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 or oh, general illness and all that but but spiritual intimacy gives us the strength to weather the storm when we face it together with god um and when we face it together with god we become you know almost unbeatable now a, a lot of books and magazines talk about you know what they call the g-spot uh, that if you stimulate properly, uh, should give you sexual pleasure. Forget, you know, uh, 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 I think there's, you know, the, one of the books that I've been able to get this, some of this material I'm talking to you about is a book called Doa by uh, Moreizi and Karo Anjao. Uh, and in that book, they say, forget the G-spot. They say go for the S spot, and and the S spot is the spiritual intimacy, that place where you connect spiritually. See, as you develop spiritual intimacy in your marriage, it it just it can take your your marriage to levels that you cannot even imagine. How how do you grow in spiritual intimacy? <laughs> It's not really rocket science, but it takes commitment on both sides. Some of the things that um, are helpful include growing in your own relationship with God. I mean, I, and I say, I'll say it again. I've said it before on this podcast. That one of the best gifts you can give to your spouse is a growing relationship with God. Is a growing spiritual relationship. <sighs> Pray together regularly. And so, so you bring your fire and she brings her fire or he brings his fire and you put it together. So you pray together regularly. Discuss what God is teaching you on a regular basis. Do ministry together. Spend time with other couples with similar values. Yeah, none of this comes naturally. It takes work, planning, and yet without spiritual intimacy. All other intimacies lack a foundation, even sexual intimacy. But in as much as we may long for this kind of intimacy, it's not always one that we can easily experience. Here are some of the barriers that you may face. Fear of vulnerability. Oh goodness, somebody may need to type that. Maybe the word you may need to type that word. Fear of vulnerability. I've always had a challenge pronouncing that word. I don't know. God have mercy on me. 
but when I get to heaven, I'll pronounce it properly. We, we fear to be vulnerable. And, and let me tell you, you can never experience spiritual intimacy with your spouse if you, not, you don't learn to be vulnerable. Okay? You cannot. You cannot. Because I'll tell you what, uh, as we'll see later, um, one, of the, one of the things that can jeopardize your spiritual walk with God is, uh, is un, un, unconfessed sin. And we'll talk about that later. And fear of vulnerability causes you to cover up certain things that need to be confessed. Okay, number two, uh, that really jeopardizes the chances of spiritual intimacy is different faiths, different spiritual beliefs. Uh -huh. One is, uh, you know, believes that... Uh, uh, God is in everything. One believes God is in heaven. Uh, goes to a church where they believe their their God is in Western Kenya, or oh, one believes. Uh, so you need to really sort out that. Also, in Second Corinthians chapter six verses fourteen to eighteen, talks about why it is not a good idea to be unequally yoked. Second Corinthians six fourteen to eighteen. Okay. Number three. As I mentioned earlier, guilt over unconfessed sin, unconfessed guilt that comes because of secret sin, past or present, hinder the ability to connect spiritually. They lead to a fear of being discovered and build a foundation of untruths which sabotage true trust. The only true solution is disclosure and confession. Disclosure and confession very difficult so that that guilt over unconfessed sin can sabotage your spiritual intimacy and the only true solution is disclosure and confession itself confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed i think it tells us that somewhere in the book of james I, i'm not sure uh, i may need to look for that um but here yeah, good people i must i must just say this loud and clear confession and disclosure is not easy it's not easy it's, a, it's hard but it comes with a lot of benefits freedom it leads to freedom it brings healing it brings healing i think i may have to look for that that piece of scripture that because i didn't include it in my notes let me just quickly try and get it uh uh, uh, confess uh, your sins one to another. Mm -hmm. James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. See, that is an instruction from scripture and it's an instruction to believers amongst their fellow believers. How much more does it apply when it comes to you and your spouse. In fact, if there's a person, and the assumption in this scripture is that you have people that hold you accountable in your spiritual growth. And I must tell you guys, there's a certain place you cannot get to in your spiritual work if you're not being held accountable. There's a place you can never, there are some sins you can never break away from unless somebody holds you accountable. Things like pornography, things like adultery, things like, these things you cannot break them just like that unless somebody holds you accountable if you're struggling with them certain fantasies if you're struggling with them because of things that you used to do in the past they must be confessed and confession brings healing and good people we must create a safe environment for people to disclose and confess and the cornerstone of a safe environment is that none of us is perfect. None of us is perfect. And, and how would you want to be treated if you're the one who is confessing? Treat people like that. Treat people like that. If you make a mistake and people don't know about it and you come to confess, I mean, how would you want to be treated? If you borrowed somebody's car and you went with it and you, know, you, you pranked the car, you messed up with the car and you're bringing it back, how would you want to be treated? 
So treat people the way you want to be treated. Do unto others what you would want them to do to you. And so this place of, of, of disclosure and, and confession, we need to create a safe environment in the home. I mean, look here. You, sh you should be the safest person your spouse can come to to make a confession. But, but some of us make it so hard because it, you're quickly to judge, you're quick to judge, quick to... Ah, may God help us. May God help us. May God help us. So healing. And then uh, number three is uh, when we confess, when we, we, it brings a sense of intimacy. And I, I well, let me just mention that uh, uh, when you don't confess a secret, guilt causes you to struggle internally. And in the process, the spouse gets pushed away. Through con though confession may bring pain, it may bring pain. I can't lie to you. It may bring pain now, okay, or at the moment you're making the confession. It may bring pain, okay? But it is the only way to open the door to true intimacy in the future. Mm. And then the other thing it brings, confession and, and, and uh, 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 disclosure, it brings, you know, openness. In the in the in the in the in the relationship, when you are vulnerable enough with your spouse, oh, I was able to pronounce it. When you are vulnerable enough, okay, uh, let's move on. You open the door for them to be vulnerable <laughs> with you in the future, which leads to more healing and more intimacy. More healing and more intimacy. Ultimately, we all want a marriage built on trust and open, openness, and not deception. And not deception. It can become chaos. Confession is never easy. This is because we are not sure how our spouses will, you know, treat us thereafter as a couple. We need to learn how to listen to a confession by our partner. Even more importantly, how to forgive. How to forgive. And here are some of the tips that you can you can put in place uh, just to help you um, uh, in that place of allowing your spouse to be naked and not ashamed. Because I said, this is, a, this is the foundation of all this intimacy. Hey, Lord, will you be able to finish all this? God have mercy on us. As I said earlier, listen to understand. Listen to understand. Listen to understand. Uh, and, 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 and don't be quick to make your own conclusions when, they, when your spouse comes to you. And when they are beginning to share something very sensitive, try and be quiet. Don't unnecessarily interrupt. You know, if possible, say, let me take a note and write down. <laughs> okay, you, you, you said you did what? Okay, and write down. Be quiet. Um, and, and just listen. Okay? If, if possible, if it's too heavy on you, ask for time to think about it, to process what they have just said. If you choose to respond immediately, think carefully and choose your words. Choose your words carefully. Choose your words carefully. And my, my, my humble suggestion, don't text. Don't write anywhere, anything. Don't. Don't, there should not be a record because that record can become a problem in the future. Okay? Just tell them words. Okay? It's easy to, it's easy to, to, to say, I, I, it's not me who say that. I don't even, I don't even know that vocabulary. <laughs> but, <laughs> but don't write an SMS saying, you know, uh, you know, how foolish can you be to do such a thing? The moment you do that, that is embedded somewhere. Okay? Pray silently. Pray that your spouse will sense your concern and support and interest in what, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, they're saying. Pray for understanding and insight on how to respond. You know, pray. And if possible, just pause and say, okay, thank you for sharing what you've shared. Uh, let us pray.
and in your prayer say lord help me help me to respond wisely uh, to this and, and and i think this is very critical then keep confidences look here i mean we've had, we had cases where people open up to their spouses and when visitors come ah like the other day he was, he was telling me she was telling me and it says come on you can't do that oh you've gone and shared it with your cousins come on you can't do that appreciate their vulnerability appreciate just appreciate that they have become vulnerable um allow them to to have their say without shaming or embarrassing them because maybe you're the last uh, 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 opportunity they have to process this thing with somebody uh, without feeling like they're saying something foolish and if you kind of shame them they lock it in and that can kill them okay um, now for the confessor if you are the one who has confessed and your spouse is having difficulty accepting what you have said allow them time and room to grieve over what you have said whatever the case be careful not to make judgment or unreasonable conclusions so uh, allow them time allow them time understand they are struggling with it and honestly there are some things if you confess to me honestly i will struggle i will struggle and you can't just be unreasonable to think i'll be happy uh, that you've been uh, sending you know interesting text messages to to you know my my one of my friends huh? i can't just be excited honestly you that you're becoming you know interestingly attached to one of my 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 boys my boys that i hang out with i can't throw a party for that it's an issue and so allow me to grieve allow me to struggle with this allow me to struggle with a sense of betrayal allow me to struggle as i try my best to find the place of forgiveness now my good bishop says that the 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 more you get to know me uh the more you will need to forgive me <laughs> that's what he says <laughs> It says the more you get to the more you get to know me, the more you will need to forgive me. Because from afar, there are some things you will not see about your spouse, especially those of you who are planning to get married. You gotta know that. That the more you become close to each other, the more you will need to forgive. The more you will need to forgive, because none of us is perfect and we need forgiveness. And a good marriage, a good marriage. A good marriage give me any good marriage give me go and look for any good marriage that has been over 10 years go and gather them put them together let's do a research on them let's interview them let's talk to them you will come to realize that one of the factors that has kept them going is the ability to forgive and overlook certain things we have to forgive and overlook certain things may god give us grace and forgiveness is one of those things that is life-giving life giving it just gives life to the marriage life to the marriage life to the marriage i mean some of the most beautiful stories i've heard about marriages uh in in, in my life in my in my experience of dealing with couples are those stories where people forgave each other crazy stuff and they're able to build some amazing okay my time is really running and uh acknowledge the wrong that has been done in the heart uh, if possible that's why you need a mentor couple to come and help you especially if you're willing to share the sensitivities of what you've dealt with if you're not willing to share that's all right but we really recommend that you have people that you can really trust that you can process some very sensitive things with uh, and we've got those people that we try and share some of these sensitive th things with okay forgiveness is not always instant it's a process and so you need to allow each other the process and you need to allow each other the time to work together to rebuild trust because once trust has been taken away uh, you have to really work together to rebuild don't just expect your spouse to trust you uh, tomorrow morning because you confessed uh, the, tonight and then tomorrow morning they wake up and they are trusting you you've got to put in some work uh, 
to rebuild that trust. Okay, so much for spiritual oneness. I wish we had all the time to talk about it. Uh, it's a whole conversation, but let me throw in physical oneness. Now, guys, if you will not get anything else about physical oneness, and especially for those of you who are already married, if you will not get anything else, I'll mention because we have run out of time. You need to remember this, that if you can do a good job at intellectual, social, emotional, and spiritual oneness, if you do a good job at those, at those, then you don't need a seminar on physical oneness. Okay? You may need somebody to help you to be creative here and there. I'm talking about specifically for those of you who are married. But if you haven't done a good job at all those four intimacies I've talked about, and you have all the creativity for for physical sexual intimacy, it will not go far. It will be like bushfire. It burns and then it goes. It will not go far. But if these four intimacies are in place and they are thriving and you're putting in enough work into them, then, then good people, it will be so much easy for you to build physical oneness. And these four intimacies we've talked about earlier on, you can, talking to those of us who are not yet married, you can begin to build those intimacies with whoever you're planning to get married to them. By the time you're becoming husband and uh, wife, you've walked down the aisle and you have, you know, the blessing to start um, expressing physical intimacy with each other um, on your marriage bed. Ah, you don't need uh, people to um, show you videos on how to do this. But anyway, because we must talk about this, allow me to, it sounds like an anti-climax, but it's okay. Just follow me. This physical oneness is what we, you know, call sexual intimacy. And, and uh, somebody was asking if I can do, I can, I can uh, name the four areas again. Uh, those are the, I think, I think the word you can outline them. You can just say the, the intimacy that I've mentioned and just put them on the chat for somebody to see. All right. Uh, intellectual, social, uh, emotional, and spiritual. Okay. So we've said that the previous mentioned intimacies form the foundation of good sex life. And unlike modern myths that advocate that good sex requires well-sculptured bodies and knowledge of techniques, in reality, body shape or, or, or size, physical attractiveness, or vast knowledge of sexual techniques are far from the critical factors when it comes to having a fulfilling sex life. Mm -hmm. This is talking to several couples. Okay, Developing intellectual, emotional, social, and spiritual intimacy is, is, is more likely to help you achieve sexual satisfaction than the factors mentioned above. That is body size and all that. They play a part. They are good. But good people, uh, these other factors outweigh them. Okay? Today, uh, I think I would want to no, because there are many myths out there with, with regards to sexual intimacy. Allow me to just deal with a couple of them. Uh, hopefully, if we have run out of time, we'll stop there. Myth number one, God is not interested in sex. God is interested in sex. He created it. He is the one who came up with it. He is the one who, who showed Adam and Eve how to go about it. Hmm? Told them, now Adam and Eve, I don't know if he talked to them. <laughs> about it but yeah uh, sadly many believe that uh, this myth that god is not interested in sex he is interested in sex okay um and probs 5 18 to 19 may he talks about this whole sexual thing says may your fountain be blessed may you rejoice with the wife of your youth uh, a loving doe a graceful dear may her breast satisfy you always may you ever be captivated by her love um Oh, you know, uh, who would have thought the Bible would talk about things like this? But yeah, God takes sex, sex so seriously. That one whole book of the Bible, Songs of, of Songs, 
describes quite explicitly a romantic sexual relationship between two lovers, okay? Uh, and it is inspired, it's in the Bible. It is God's will that a man and a woman who are married, okay, enjoy each other in a mutually satisfying relationship as they fulfill each other's emotional and sexual needs. All right, myth number two, one cannot be satisfied with one partner. Mm -mm, uh -uh. Okay, that, that's a myth, that one cannot be satisfied with one partner. That's a myth. The problem with this myth is that it is based on a misunderstanding of sex. Sexual satisfaction grows over time with, with, with you know, time built with one, the same partner, it, over time. And, 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 and this is dependent on the growth of their relationship, not on the frequency or technique. Although they are important, especially frequency. Good people, hey, important. Uh, initially, a man's sexual relationship with his wife is based on physical attraction. Very true. Uh, with time, sexual attraction is deepened by an enriched relationship. Uh -huh. Much as an affair may seem exciting, and in the end, you know, it is reverted to purely biological sex and a sense of being shortchanged for true intimacy and oneness. Okay? True, you know, and I'm talking this from, from a man's perspective, it can begin a physical attraction, but over time it, it's enhanced by a certain kind of relationship. Okay? Um, let me read Malachi 2, 13 to 16. It says, it's another thing you do. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention. For some reason, the Bible is talking more to men. I don't even know why, but, you know, we'll just see how to balance this out. You weep and wail as, uh, and he no longer pays attention to your offerings. You accept them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner. Um, the wife of your marriage covenant has not the Lord made them one in flesh and in spirit. They are his. And why one? Because you are seeking a, a godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit. Do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says uh, the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with this garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in spirit. Do not break faith. And I think the emphasis here is ah, do whatever you can to keep this thing going. Unfortunately, that may not be the reality because in many instances you find that we are forced to be in certain spaces. But the ideal situation is that this thing may work. And it is in flesh and in spirit. And I think the emphasis there flesh and spirit flesh is sexual intimacy and spirit is uh, it's probably it encompasses all these other intimacies i've talked about myth number three i need to quickly do this we may not even have time for questions today Zawadi. this is crazy and i must say this okay because i know in some quarters this has been a problem pornography enhances sexual experience uh -uh, it does not it does not uh, where some may advocate that using porn may, you know, bring in a bit of creativity and all that, in the end, it does not promote oneness. Using an image to a, a, a achieve sexual gratification does not build a kind of genuine intimacy that leads to sexual oneness and intimacy in marriage. It is literally like having a third person in the union. In fact, having more than a third person in the union. And quite apart from pornography, many people experience the frustration of having an intrusive thoughts or even making comparisons of their past sexual encounters with their spouses. They can be frustrating, and especially as one determines to make a clean break from the past. And, and I, I think we, we must make mention of this, as I mentioned earlier about disclosure and confession. It's important to... Um, have that conversation about breaking soul ties with your spouse is if you're interested in developing uh, solid sexual intimacy with them so that 
you don't you're not finding yourself secretly comparing them with somebody you had encounters with in the past and and they can help you pray about it they can help you you know de deal with it and and they can be in the picture it it helps a lot just that confession breaks a lot it breaks that soul tie all right so so if if you have if you had some major sexual relationships in the past to be in the right footing confess uh, to one another your past sexual encounters including involvement with pornography or sex toys or masturbation and things like that i mean make that known to your spouse all right uh, and then good people we are living in an over sexualized world extend forgiveness extend forgiveness i mean it's not realistic to expect that whoever you will meet and become an item with even if it's in the church that they have never had sexual ex ex escapades in the past they have hurt them and so you just be realistic good people you're not marrying an angel uh -uh. you're marrying a human being and they're really seeking to have god help them to become better people be part of the process of helping them to become better people as they break from their past all right some of them have gone through rape have gone through sexual abuse, understand them and be gentle with them. Okay? Be gentle. It's not their choice. Be gentle with them, especially men. Be gentle with your wives. Uh, if they have had a history and they have to get over it and they have to, certain things may remind them and you really want those things to be done. <laughs> uh, you know, you need to be conscious of those things and make a sacrifice and say, okay, for the sake of, of not taking you back to your painful past, we will not go there in as much as you want some fantasies okay all right uh but well we need to be gracious with each other and ha ah, it's five minutes to the top of the hour uh i i i don't even know i think we'll just have to stop there it almost feels like an anti-climax um however uh Let me see if I can mention a couple of things uh, before we is uh, uh, now to enhance sexual intimacy. Um, we've talked about forsaking all others, uh, but we also need to mention that we have to be very intentional about our sexual intimacy, very intentional, and that means sometimes, uh, you know, saying planning. <laughs> And, and 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 having that in mind it just doesn't happen don't, don't it only that can only happen in the honeymoon and all that but when you start life it just doesn't happen you have to be intentional about it um and then uh as you initiative uh is from both ends good people initiative is from both ends uh there's a theory that has been going doing grounds which suggests that it's the man that should always in, initiate which I, I don't subscribe to. I think that's a fallacy and um, it should come from both ends because uh, the problem with uh, initiative just coming from the side of a man is that they can, it can build frustration because over time, uh, the, several times the wife may, may feel like, I don't feel like, I don't want to, I don't like, and it may easily become, feel like rejection over time. And so initiative should come from both sides, okay? And then do not deprive each other unless there's mutual agreement. First Corinthians 7, 5 uh, talks to us about that. I think it's First Corinthians 7, 5. I don't know. I hope so. Uh, let me just confi confirm. Uh, I think it's First Corinthians 7, 5 that talks to us about that. We should not deprive each other. Just confirms our differences. <laughs> okay. And then, ah, let's not get into details. Uh, explore 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 and appreciate each other um i wish we had time uh, and we can't get into the technical aspect of this for now um we will just focus on the general foundation that i've laid i hope that helps you i stop there thank you so much that um, is very impactful, packed information. <laughs> if you have any notes that we can go by, that would be awesome. <laughs>
but I think it's everybody here and now we kind of have an understanding because you know sometimes you struggle so much trying to perfect the physical intimacy um it's like working on the outside in but it really is from the inside out and just like jesus said if you wash the cup from the inside even the outside will be clean so knowing that god is the founder of marriage he's the founder of sexuality and knowing that when we're intimate with him individually and then we're intimate with him together as the head and then we you know he he helps us choose the right people you know friendships the right you know way to go about everything then physically we connect you know it's it's usually just an overflow like you said it's an overflow of all these other intimacies so and it will be easier for uh, couples to speak about this once they have taken care of all the other intimacy. So thank you so much because you have actually helped some of us to kind of stop and hey, we missed some steps. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's go back and pray together. Let's go back and, you know, get find intimacy with God and, you know, emotionally be a comfort place for each other that I can, I can be able to share whatever I go through without being judged, without being belittled, without, uh, you know. Yeah, so thank you so much, Rev Chogo. Thank you because you allowed God to use you in this capacity and the wisdom that you have given. Some of us, we don't do research. We just show up in marriage and we, ex we expect it to, let's just go, this thing. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you so much. God increase you. God bless your marriage. God bless your family. May the perfect uh, grace of God be upon you. May he continue to increase wisdom in upon your life. May he grace you. May he heal every aspect of any part of your, your life, your children. May your children always be aligned to God's will and purpose. And may they always grow in the house and the will of God. Thank you so much for pouring into so many families. And I pray that the same pouring that you have poured, may God continue to pour into your family, into your marriage, into every aspect and area of your life just because of your faithfulness we know it could have been easy for you to say you know what i'm having issues with my son i cannot be here but you literally left them at the hospital yesterday to come and do that which god entrusted you with so thank you we don't take it for granted and god sees it and we just I, we are humbled you you have been a leader by example and you have inspired me. I'm sure you have inspired so many, but I'm speaking for me. You have really inspired me. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to um, end, but is there anybody who feels like I have to ask this one question? I must ask this one question, Bawadi. There is no way Rev Chogo is going without answering my question. Anybody feeling that way? I'm going to give you... Um, one chance to unmute yourself and ask that question. <laughs> because yesterday I said, come with questions. So I don't want to be a liar. I want to be like my father, God, who, who, who keeps his word. <laughs> Nobody? Okay, wonderful people. Thank you so much for showing up again. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being present. I pray that this seed that God has put in us will grow deep roots and it will germinate, that our marriages will never be the same again. They will actually thrive out of what we have been taught. And God will work in us as well as in our spouses to make sure that our marriages, our marriages will represent him faithfully. Faithfully, because marriage was his idea. We don't want the world to look at marriages that God, you know, in the and go like, what is this? They can't even have a blueprint to follow. So we want to be that example of what marriage is. So thank you so much again. God bless you. And I will give it back to our speaker to end with a word of prayer. And when you go in July, make sure you put everything in, in action, right? So that when you come in August, we are ready for more. God bless you. Okay. Yeah, I think I tried to unmute myself at some point and it was refusing to unmute. So I, I think maybe some people have tried to unmute themselves and they couldn't unmute. <laughs> I hope, I hope not. I hope not.
I hope not. But we'll pray. Uh, we'll pray, and uh, if there are any questions uh, that which we could try and just answer, I don't know how we're going to do that. You've got a WhatsApp page or something like that where I could we could post. I could send you the questions, the answers. Sorry, and you post. And I also tried to 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 put together the quote unquote material uh, that I have because I've picked from different sources. Uh, I'll try to just combine uh, and and send it over. Uh, hopefully this time I'll, I think I've sent you notes before. I suspect. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. I'll try and and just... So yeah. All right. I'll send them. I'll send whatever I put together. All right. So could we pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of uh, uh, you created us to be in your own image and likeness. When you said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. And you exist in a, a fellowship that is intimate. Fellowship of the... And your image, nothing, nothing, no institution, no arrangement here on earth reflects your image like marriage. It is the only institution where you talk about entities becoming one. And that oneness is the oneness that you share in the Trinity. And, and so marriage becomes one of the most, almost accurate representation of uh, your essence as a triune God. So I pray that you'll help us uh, as your people, those of us who are already married in this forum, uh, to experience that privilege of oneness. Where there is any obstacle and hindrance because of things we've gone through, have mercy on us and help us uh, to overcome those obstacles that we have, may have talked about or not talked about to come to the place of oneness. Those of us in this forum who probably in one or the other, uh, they were in that journey and one or two things happened and they um, have been deprived of that privilege. May you remember them and give them yet another chance of experiencing oneness uh, if it is still within their scope of desire to experience it. Have mercy, O oh God of mercy, and second chances. Those of us who are beginning that journey yet to begin that journey, I pray specifically for those who have begun to debt, help them with the wisdom we have talked about, to begin to develop intimacy and go down that journey. And I pray for those who are yet to have mercy on them to make the right choices. Mercy, O oh God, because we are limited in our knowledge and discernment. Give us discernment. Bless your people. Watch over them. Bless their relationships. Bless the work of their hands. And may you do them good. Thank you, Lord. I commit each one of us into your hands and to your grace. And may you bless us and keep us. May you cause your face to shine upon each one of us. May you turn your face towards each one of us and be gracious to us and give us peace. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <sighs> Amen. Amen. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> God bless you. All right. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your month and the night or evening or day, wherever you are. Amen. Bye.